Hello and welcome to another post-game edition of the Nittany Dispatch. I am John Sauber of the Center Daily Times. She is Audrey Snyder of The Athletic. And we are back from Detroit with uh, Penn State having put together one of its best performances of the season. We are exhausted. Uh, yes. <laughs> as we record out. this uh, Saturday night, we've... Uh, God, these night games, John, I know we complain about them a lot. You like them more than I do. I but do. yeah, we're, we're running on like three and a half hours sleep. We made the uh, about six hour drive back to State College Saturday morning. We're recording Saturday night after a day in which I spent most of the day on the couch, John, watching these other games. And it was glorious. Yeah. And uh, I, I just told you before we recorded that I did the same uh, and was intermittently falling asleep. But J.J. McCarthy's clap count uh, essentially <laughs> woke me up before every play. So was, was able any drifting off I did, uh, I was able to wake up to see pretty much every play. Uh, but, yeah, it was a wild day of college football. Um, and I still think going on, too. Uh, we just, yeah, we just still going the, on, uh, too. The end of the Apple Cup, and we've got Florida, Florida State going on right now. Yep. Um, and uh, Oklahoma State potentially – having the chance to play spoiler to a New mm-hmm. Year's Six bid. Uh, Alabama <laughs> pulling out one of the most insane endings. Crazy you'll Iron Bowl. Uh, but let's, let's start with Friday night, uh, where, like I said, Penn State was, uh, unlike most of these teams, yeah, unnerved by the final weekend of college football in the regular season and destroyed Michigan State from, from pretty much the opening kick with the exception of like how they finished the first few mm-hmm. drives. Yeah, I mean, I think we were sitting there at the half, right? And it's like, Penn State's dominating. They have the Jalen Reed interception. Um, and it's like they have 13 points to show for it. And at that point, I think they were they were over 300 yards of total offense. And you're just looking at it and you're like, all right, the, the offense, offense is stalling out. Uh, but other than that, I mean, Aller, of course, starts, which was a little bit interesting. I mean, James Franklin was consistent all week in saying that they thought he would play. Yeah. He did play. He also thought and said that they planned to use the two quarterback package. And we did see Bo Prabula all throughout the game. And then, of course, he took over in the fourth quarter, uh, early in the fourth, when when Drew was done for the day with, with the game out of hand. But, yeah, to me, John, this is one of those, I, I will say, the most complete showing. I mean, I think I think back to the Maryland game when it's like, oh, this offense is explosive. But this was more explosive, right? This, to me, was you were able to get Nick Singleton going, right? We talked about Rutgers and how maybe the end of that game would kind of spark something for him. And I think it did. Uh, You know, I mean, I think you look at it and Singleton has the reception that goes for, I believe, 53 yards. Katron Allen has the 50-yard run in the first half. Uh, Actually, both of those guys had had those 50-plus play yards in the first quarter, I believe it was. Um, So to me, that, that was what stood out. We saw the receiver rotation early and often, which is something I have been writing about on The Athletic, something I'm sure we will get into here. very interesting. Uh Uh-huh. So, yeah, I I mean, I think that is just kind of, there's a lot to to dissect from this one, even if, you know, hey, this is not the the rivalry game like what we're seeing most of this weekend. But Penn State did secure your favorite and our favorite, the beloved land-grant trophy. And that will be the last that it's mentioned on this podcast. Oh, definitely uh, not. I'm just getting warmed up, the, John. What is the last I will acknowledge it on this podcast? Uh, but no, I, I think to go back to one of the points you made about like it being better than Maryland, mm-hmm. what made this different was that there was something schematic that made Maryland kind of so easy for them, right? right. Uh, they they talked about it, how often essentially Maryland just brought a ton of pressure, uh, zero blitzed, left no safeties over the top. They could just take t- take deep shot after deep shot. This wasn't that like they were just taking advantage of the Michigan State's uh, Michigan Michigan State defense. Excuse me, lack of talent compared to mm-hmm. Penn State. Like there were several occasions where Amari Evans was open deep down the field. Aller hit him on the one with the sixty yarder. One, yeah, one of the best passes you'll see in college football this year. Mm-hmm. Like I know, like it was it was gorgeous. Like it was one of those throws that um, uh, Bob Flounders, who I, I sat next to. Friday night too said he said he had him and like as a, as the ball was in the air I think kind of inferring that he uh, missed him and I said he hit him like as the ball was yeah. like down because you started to see that he had put it on the money it was just like it is it is a sign of a cool calm collected Drew Aller uh, you know and I think that, that's an NFL throw John that is an NFL throw without a doubt uh, before we get too far into it though don't forget rate review and subscribe to the podcast. Uh, we always appreciate that. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that thumbs up button down below. Hit the subscribe button. Go to Apple Podcasts if you're listening there. Leave us a five-star rating and review there. That always helps us out. 
Uh, but no, this was this was Drew. Speaking of five stars, Drew Aller. Ooh, uh, good transition. We're uh, on a roll, and I am delirious. That's what that is. <laughs> yeah, this is really this is like going to be a liability tonight, John. Like, this yeah, is... we're gonna we're gonna see if I can keep my job. Uh, no, mm-hmm. but the the uh, the Aller pass was an incredible one, and Amari was actually open early. I think it was in the mm-hmm. third quarter as well when uh, Keandre Lambert Smith looked yes. ran what, yep. looked like a corner route, and uh, he ran a post behind it, and he beat the safety. And Amari, I asked Amari about this after the game, and he said Drew told him that he just got to him late. Um, and that's why he didn't throw it. And like, if, if Drew thought it was late and the safety was going to make the play on the ball, he made the right decision. Cause he also had a guy open 20 right. yards down the field rather mm-hmm. than 50. Um, but yeah, it was, it was one of those games where I don't know, like, this is why you brought Drew Aller in. If you're Penn state, right? Like this is everything you'd hoped it would be. Um, he dissected the Michigan state defense. He was decisive. He was confident. He was poised. He didn't, he didn't look like, frankly the quarterback that we had seen most of the season i know some people compared it to the west virginia game i thought this was significantly yeah. better than the west virginia game uh especially God, from the west a, virginia a game feels like standpoint. it was like three years ago admittedly right it was almost three months ago already uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean it, I, you mentioned keandre lambert smith john and that kind of jogged my memory again interesting to see the number one wide receiver and kind of what's playing out here uh to me, this is really fascinating. Uh, Lambert Smith finished with one catch for 22 yards, which of course came in the third quarter. He did not have a single target in the entire first half, which to me, this is one of your most explosive players on the field. Um, again, find a way to get him involved. Like to me, that was, that's been really interesting. And that, and that goes back to the Michigan game. But the flip side of that is what they wanted to do and what they've been doing the last few games is they're digging into that rotation early. Um, you know, we we were looking at it between the first two drives. Let's, let's see if I can do this from memory, John. This is a big risk. So you had Keandre Lambert-Smith, you had Dante Cephas, you had Malik McClain, you had no Harrison Wallace because he, again, still remains out, hasn't played since Indiana. We'll now see if, Correct. if he makes his triumphant return at the bowl game or not. Um, but then on top of that, you had Liam Clifford, who was out there. Uh, we saw Caden Saunders early. We saw Amari Evans. Um I think that was I think that was everybody in the first two drives at least receiving core wise. Um I thought we had seen Malik Mega, but I don't remember how that we later on in the game we did. Later on I, in the game, there was I, a first design two drives. I don't think we did, but there was a play designed for him, and I thought, oh, we're really they're they're gonna dig deep real, in the deep bag, in the bag yeah. of tricks tonight. Uh if they're throwing that uh out there. But no, they they were trying to go for the rotation, and I, I you're right, like they need to get Lambert Smith involved, mm-hmm. but Frankly, some of it is on him too, right? There weren't right. always, he didn't always finish his routes. Frankly, there was a deep ball where there he looked up to was... track the ball mm-hmm. and it was already in the air. And because he slowed, he slowed down when he looked up to track it and it looked like an overthrow, but I thought it was a great throw by Aller. Um, and Lambert Smith just didn't get to it because he, he looked up to track it and slowed down uh, pretty significantly. So there are some scenarios like that too, where, where uh, Keandre can afford to help out Aller. Now there were other times where he was open too, but yeah, it's a it's a push and pull there, right? Like it's um, part of it is you want to get your best player involved. Another part of it is like you got to find out what you have in the rest of these guys. And I think, frankly, that might be more important for this team moving forward than anything. Yeah, this is the 2024 audition is what I'm calling it because um, I asked James Franklin about it last week. And, and at that point, it's like, hey, Amari Evans suddenly was playing all these snaps. Like, why is that? Has something changed? Um and it seems like John really the only thing that's changed is the offensive coordinator, right? I mean, it just seems like there are certain things now that they are more committed to, right? We saw the Bo Perbula package early in the game, and James Franklin said afterward again, "Yeah, we wanted to do this all season, and we've really just been able to get to it the last two games." Which to me, again, telling Gee, comments. What changed in those last two games? Did something who happen? changed? Did something? Is there something different? Um, beats me. Yeah. Yeah. To, to me that, again, that's one of those, uh, one of those comments that, that you file away, um, about the, the former OC. And we do know, um, since we're recording this Saturday night, James Franklin told us after the game that he is conducting OC interviews via zoom Saturday and Sunday. So we'll see what the timeline brings for that. I'm sure whatever is the most inconvenient time for you and I is probably I was say, whatever it is. Break. It's going to be um, really stressful when it happens. I know that. But yeah, I mean, so, so that's kind of where uh, obviously where things stand on that front. But the other thing, John, to me, um, career day for Catron Allen, 15 carries, 137 yards, had the long rush of 50. 
And Nick Singleton, like I mentioned earlier, 18 carries, 118 yards, and a touchdown with a long run of 24. We also saw a 28-yard run from Trey Potts. Uh, so again, getting all three backs involved there eventually. Um, but to me, this is... <laughs> It feels like this is what we thought we were going to see in September, yes. right? It took a while. It took 12 games for it to, to get here. But are we on to something here, John? Is is this or is this just like kind of a flash in the pan? What do you think? No, I, I, when I wrote about it uh, after the game, I called it a building block, right? Like this mm -hmm. is this is step one, right? Like this is for the next offensive coordinator. They see that, okay, this is kind of what the formula might look like. Or are there some things you can pick out of, out of this game that, that can uh, help you succeed? Mm -hmm. um, as my dog barks in the background, I apologize. Say your dog's that. losing it now. Great. He's, he's a very good boy. It's not my fault. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, uh, this is one of those things where you have to use it as a building block and a launching point. Um, and we'll see uh, if they can actually do that. Um, I tend to think that they will, right? I, I think this this felt like, I don't know, I, I, I hate to be like the vibes guy, but like it felt meaningful for Aller to have this kind of performance. You know, it felt meaningful for it, him to look that good. It felt meaningful for the running backs to get back on track. And you mentioned Singleton. I thought early in the game he was kind of struggling running the ball, and then he mm -hmm. started to get more decisive as the game wore on, and I started thought he started to look better, frankly, than he did even early in the game. Um, and so I think... For all of those guys, this this has to mean something more, and I think more than any of them, it has to mean something more for Aller. Um, you mentioned what changed too. Like I asked guys after the game what was different, and and other people asked players too, and all of it was it simplicity. Was simplified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything. That's is word's been coming up a lot the last two weeks, John. It's it's a buzzword yeah. around here. And I asked Bo Prabula like to elaborate on that, right? Like, what did mm -hmm. he mean by simpler? He said, uh, "It's it's just like they're sticking to what they're." good at essentially and they're perfecting it kind of right rather than trying to do too many things and uh reach into the bag of tricks too often uh wide receiver passes I've... they didn't say wide receiver passes to be clear i am saying wide receiver passes mm -hmm. uh but they 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 mentioned like or bo mentioned specifically like reaching into the bag of tricks too often um and when he said that like it, it was one of those things it was like okay <laughs> like i get it um but well... he he said like it allows guys to play faster and and that for the last two weeks, they've been practicing faster, too. And that matters as, as well, right? When you're not having to work on as much and you can kind of maximize what you're working on, it it tends to bode well. Yeah. I, so this is the, the simplicity piece is something that has, has come up a lot. Um, I was talking to Liam Clifford about that after practice last week, and it's something that he brought up as well. And then I brought up, I said, well, are you saying that it was too complex previously with Mike Yurcich? And he's like, well, I wouldn't say that. And he kind of towed the company line um, with that. But they're playing faster, right? And the thing Drew Aller, who we did talk to after the game, and there's a lot to unpack there that we will yes. get to in a second. Um, but I pulled up this quote from my story on The Athletic from something that Aller said. Because, again, this is the first time we talked with QB1 since Mike Yurcich is firing. So there was a lot of ground to cover post game. Uh, but but the quote that he said, which again goes to our buzzword, John, Aller's direct quote, we talk about simplicity equals speed. We may not be running super simple stuff, but we made really easy rules for all of us. And I think that's why we've been clicking more in the passing game. So again, play fast with simplicity. They're onto something here. Uh, to me, that's that's kudos to Jaywan Sider and Ty Howell and James Franklin for all kind of coming together and, and figuring this out and putting this offense in a position to succeed, right? Like this is your entire offensive staff. Again, we still don't know who's actually playing calls. James Franklin uh, was asked about this last week and didn't would not say. But yeah, to me, that, that's absolutely a theme here. And I'm curious how it kind of carries into bowl prep, right? Because that's, of course, what what comes up next. Um, but Aller completed 17 of 26 passes for 292 yards with two touchdowns. Um, the numbers, John, as James Franklin said, I think any any coach in the country would take these for Aller this year. First, of course, as the full-time starter, 23 touchdown passes and just one interception. Um, obviously, we've talked plenty about that one pick and whether or not it needed to happen or if that was just more of a narrative or kind of whatever came of that. Um, I think we found out pretty quickly after that, that it did not need to happen. <laughs> yeah. I think there, there were some other things that needed to happen with that offense more so than an interception. Yes. Right. Um, 
But uh, this kind of brings us to the the bigger picture kind of forward looking angle here. Um, and that's what I was focused on post game. And I, I said to Drew, I said, you know, we haven't talked to you since, since Mike Yersich got fired, but are you committed to being here next year, regardless of who the offensive coordinator is, right? Because that is undoubtedly a storyline in the day and age yep. of the transfer portal uh, with portal day coming soon, right? December 4th, whatever next, I think it's next Monday, I believe it's December 4th. Yeah. Next Monday. Um, with portal day coming, I just wanted to make sure we were kind of clear there. And again, my gut, as I've said on here before, all along is that Aller was not going anywhere, but I know that it's a question fans have a lot of people have. So I asked him, uh, and what he told me is that there, he doesn't really think there's a decision to make that he's committed to being here. And so then I kind of doubled down and said, Hey, I just want to make sure I'm, you know, fully understanding what you're saying here. Is this, you know, you are committed to being here in 24. And he said, yes, yes, yes. So again, that is significant. Um, I asked Nick Singleton the same thing after the game because John, to me that this backfield has kind of been the storyline of what happens long-term. And again, like I've been saying all year, Nick Singleton, Pennsylvania guy, um, staying close to home, playing for Penn state was so much of what his recruitment was about coming out of high school, which is part of the reason why he didn't go to Notre Dame was because he wanted his support system to be able to see him, you know, kind of make, make the trek down the road and watch him play. And Singleton told me that he is committed for sure to being here in 2024. And he said, I'm committed to coach Franklin. I'm committed to coach cider, the whole coaching staff. I'm telling you, I ain't leaving nowhere. I'm staying here. And then right away, I kind of had that Wolf of Wall Street image in my head, right? Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, 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 you, yeah, that one. You going to repeat um, it? I'm not. Yeah, that's if if this is this could be our last podcast ever, John, if we do. So that's I think right. we'll have to sit that one out. Um, but no, to, to me, those are two significant questions for 2024 that I wanted to get answers to. And I, I'm glad we did. But yeah, I mean, I think that's that's what time of year we're at, right? We're waiting on the bowl yeah, game and, and we're figuring out who's going to be here and who's opting in, who has NFL decisions to make. Like, that is where we're at. When I think this is a part of college football now, right? Like, some people may be surprised mm -hmm. to hear that that's part of the conversation after the regular season finale. But, you know, look around the country. There are going to be some of the best players in the country are going to go in the portal. Mm -hmm. uh, guys from really good teams are going to go in the portal. And Penn State is, like, far from immune from that. Right. Like they are just as susceptible to that as any other team in the country. That's the reality um, of where we're yes. at in 2023 and roster turnover is going to happen. Right. I mean, every it's cycle a great job. sign that those two said that they're going to be back. Mm -hmm. Like this is the two building blocks of that class and mm -hmm. the building block of the program. And Aller has said that he's going to be at Penn state in 2024. And now they can move forward, essentially assuming that not that I'm saying they ever thought uh, otherwise, but you know, uh, it is always good to for us to have that definitive answer so we know what we're looking at, right? Like in uh, how you judge what they're bringing in. Like, is there any, like, hey, do you need to be asking people about Drew Aller's status and things like that, mm -hmm. you know, for the next couple of weeks? But yeah, I think now that, you know, he's going to be back, it's about building this thing around him. And you know, you mentioned Amari. Like, I think you know that Amari can have a role on next year's team. Uh, you know, if Dante Cephas comes back, I think he can absolutely have a role on next year's team. Uh, Trey Wallace, you know, if he gets healthy, yep. another guy that can have a role like that. And so it's about have, having guys that have those roles and then finding the guy or the number two guy. Uh, and I think that's going to be important this offseason. Well, you say all that, John, and you're kind of there's like an elephant in the room there when you say that, because you just glossed oh, over the number about? one wide receiver. And did I do that mm -hmm. huh. again? I'm, I'm big on big on details around here. Um, that doesn't sound like something I'd do. Yeah, right. Just kind of glossed over that one. Again, there is an NFL decision to be made for Keandre Lambert Smith. Um, again, we don't know what this is. John probably just is too sleep deprived and and I think omitted it for that reason, but I could be wrong. Um, but but I do wonder, and again, we haven't talked to Keandre in the last couple of weeks. He hasn't been available, but I do wonder um kind of what's been going on in his head, right? As you come down this this stretch run of the season. Uh, he had a huge game against Michigan State last year. That was kind of the one that started to turn the corner for him ahead of the Rose Bowl, that springboard. So I, I do wonder kind of what's going on there. I mean, there were a couple scenes yesterday that I caught with my binoculars um, on the sideline where Marcus Hagans went over to him and kind of patted him on the head and was like, hey, keep your head up. I mean, this was early in the third quarter before he had, he had even been targeted. Um so, you know, you wonder, and again, this is us looking across the field, so you can't you can't see much from that far away. 
Um, and we're not involved in those discussions. Like I'm not like neither of us are going to speculate on like mm -hmm. exactly what was said or how Keandre feels. I'm not an expert lip reader, John. Yeah. I'll, let's we'll let's put that out there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going full body language doctor on this one, but no, I, I think like listen, I think it's pretty clear that Keandre has a decision to make, right? About what his plans are for next year, and that's why honestly, that's part of the reason I omitted him because we just don't know. Like I, I, I feel confident in saying that those other guys are probably going to be back pretty much the, that group um but we just don't know with with keandre right i think uh if you'd asked me at the beginning of the year i would have said that he would have left for the nfl draft i don't know if that's true mm -hmm. now it's it still could be what he does it, you know he he could back he could he could do whatever but yeah i think that you know that is that is kind of the one to to monitor at this point right like what he does um you know i think it's a little different obviously than parker washington last year uh so we'll see what what lambert smith does and and what his decision is, but I think that obviously impacts this offense in a pretty big way because, uh, you know, he's, he's their leading receiver right now and they need as many of those guys as they can get. Yeah. And you know, you, the tight ends too, right? We saw it again. Um, Tyler Warren with a touchdown, Theo Johnson from Windsor with a touchdown. So a nice little homecoming moment there. Um, Penn state. Did you catch this stat, John leads the FBS? I don't know. You haven't said it yet. Well, I, I'm building the suspense here. Uh, Penn State leads the FBS in touchdowns by tight ends. Did you know that? No, I did not know that. Yeah, see, just dropping knowledge here. Um, That's right. That was a stat that, or at least that was going into today, right, where things stood. So, again, a big year for these tight ends. Um, also, two interesting decisions, I think, coming you know, coming down there. Um, I asked both of them about it last week. They both kind of glossed over it because of Michigan State, but – That'll be a question that we'll certainly be asking again um, with, with bowl selection coming and that type of thing. Anything else on the offense, John, before we, we get into this defense, anything else that. No, I, I think like, you know, this was Penn state fans should be really excited about what they saw um, and what they heard from those players after the game. Right. Like in, so are you getting people's hopes up on. again, John? Like, cause it feels like we're kind of starting this. I'm sorry. Cyclical are thing. you going to, are you going to not predict them? predict that they make the playoff next year expanded field right i feel like you have to right um that's what i mean like that but but John, that's, that's a lot point, right? a lot can and will For happen sure. between now but and I, then i wrote about this like all of the the woes of this year and the issues like they can go away with a playoff bid next year and like they're probably gonna make the playoff next year they would have made it five of the last seven years if it was 12 teams let's take a brief pause from the podcast tell you about our good friends at voodoo brewing company in state college located at 201 elmwood street uh the good people at voodoo have been providing you and I with quality beer uh, for a while now, since they opened, I believe in 2018. Uh, I have been a frequent customer of Voodoo. Uh, love the, love the Metmosa with the uh, Voodoo Love Child and Orange Juice. Just a, a wonderful place to have a good beer in state. And good food. But John, you are also more of your cocktail guy. A lot of people probably don't peg you as that, but you're, I've seen you drink some things. Depends de de depends on the situation. But yeah, listen, yeah. I like beer too. Don't, don't need to beat around the this bush there. This is very much, yeah, John's got the kind of the, the palate of a child sometimes. But uh, no, I, I do. I very much enjoy Voodoo's beers. You hit on it with the Metmosa because if you are a beer guy or gal, but you also like orange juice, uh, go over and get a mimosa or get something from the Voodoo Kitchen. You could stop by. Also, John, this is maybe this is going to be our off season that we finally win at Voodoo Bingo or Trivia. Yeah, I don't think that that's it? happening. But you should go we'll to try. Trivia Tuesday at 6, p 6 p.m. Uh, bingo Thursday at 6 p.m. It's always a good time. With it getting cooled out, those fire pits are going to be open. Keep you nice and cozy. Uh, sit outside, have a drink, sit by the fire. Uh, the kind of environment that, that you always love to have. That is Voodoo Brewing Company at 201 Elmwood Street in State College. Back to the show. Before we get to the defense, then, because you're you're putting this you're putting this out there. Um, Ten and two regular season. James Franklin was asked kind of his thoughts on that. Um, John, what do we make of ten and two? Because it's like been here before, but you lost your two biggest games. Your your best win would have been against Iowa, which will probably go and get sacrificed at Lucas Oil Stadium next Saturday. Um, against the Wolverines. So what do you I make think of that game? I, again, I hope that game is four to two. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, that's like, could you imagine that upset? Like there's one way to really mess things up next week. Well, that would mess things up for Penn state big time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Pretty much knocks them out of the new year six at that mm -hmm. point. 
Um, Orlando, with, baby, here we come. Yeah, yeah like or Oklahoma State does the same thing. Like there, there are some scenarios here that are not good for Penn State. Um, but uh, no, I, I like. I don't know. I, I don't. That I don't side think, tells me there's something there. Yeah. So I, I don't think that I don't want to say that I don't think ten wins matter. Right. Because I like it, it is, they're right. Like when James says that stuff about like they're not going to take winning or they're not going to apologize for winning They're mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Not a lot of teams can win 10 years cons- or 10 games consistently <laughs> and 10 uh, years. consistently. Years. Yeah, right. And well, true. Uh, but they have the last two mm-hmm. years uh, heading into the postseason. And that is notable. Um, it's it's a sign that they're almost there. But how many signs do we have to see that they're almost there before we believe that they're there? Um, and I think next year they're going to there's a decent shot that they're actually 11 and one because the teams they play, they don't play Michigan for one. Right. Um, and like USC is losing Caleb Williams and mm-hmm. it was pretty terrible with them anyways. Um, UCLA is uh, going to, they're, they're seven, four right now. They play Cal tonight. Um, you know, Oregon is going to be a threat, but they don't have to play them. Washington is going to be without Michael mm-hmm. Penix uh, and Roma Dunes, who is incredible mm-hmm. as we saw in that fourth and one in the yep. Apple cup today. Great read there by Michael Penix, by the way, that play was awesome. Um, but yeah, like so, they're going to have a legitimate chance at eleven and one next year, and I don't know that it means that they're, you know, all that much better than this year's team just based on that knowledge alone, right? If they go eleven and one next year, uh, I think we'll have to see how it plays out. Now, obviously, like that's, so, you, if eleven and one, so the stumbling block, Buckeyes? Ohio State, yeah, that's but that's the thing. Like so, then again, as eleven and one with the only loss to Ohio State, does that feel any more gratifying? I don't know. They're probably like the seven seed if that's the case. Uh, and that means they're facing. I'm going to try to do math in my head. Oh boy. The 10 seed at home at Beaver Stadium. So, like, you get a home playoff game. And so, if you win that, like, then if you're in the top eight, does it feel better? I don't know. Like, it's that's the, the interesting thing about this 12 team playoff is there are going to be eight more fan bases that are like happy, I think, with their season until they lose, right? Like, it's just going to prolong. Like, they're going to be happy. I don't happier. know if Penn State fans are ever going to be happy, John, right? I think that's the... I mean, if they win a national title. Well, uh, yeah, true. But I, but I think some people might even nit- nitpick along the way in that. I mean, there was there were some folks pun. last night. Um, yeah, that was actually, that was not a pun, but I... I that was not intentional, but I, I landed the plane there. It did happen. Um, there were folks last night, you know, with Katron Allen with a 50-yard run, and they're like, he looks slow. And I was like, can we just, like, be happy <laughs> for once, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So no, I, I think the framing around the whole conversation changes next year, right? With the 12 team field, um, which I am very excited for. I am totally in favor of the 12. 12 I am too. Teams. Every time I see like the projected bracket for what this mm-hmm. year would look like, I'm just, like, just move it up. Just do it now. Yeah. It'd be more fun. I mean, and I think that's the, that's the thing, right? The schedule gets much harder for many teams. So you, you might be 10 and two and still be in the playoff, right? Like that is very much. If they the, go 10 kind of and two next year, they're going to make the playoff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just one of those, you got to kind of reframe how this, this whole thing uh, is going to come together. But we talk about, can I, can I put you on, uh, uh, on the hot uh-oh. seat real quick with a uh-oh. question? Uh-oh. Sure. Does, does any team in college football go undefeated? Does any power four, Ooh. I guess power four now, does any power four team go undefeated next year? I haven't looked at Georgia's schedule. I was going to say that that was Georgia. Uh, yeah. So I don't know who Georgia plays, but was weird. that Good would be my the power only of the internet right in front of me. So Georgia would be my only maybe. Well, that's the thing. Because Although, you I mean, because the schedule yeah, gets more but, difficult for everyone. What oh, the Georgia well, I said, what's the Michigan schedule? I mean, they're going to have to play Ohio State again. And like that's mm-hmm. protected rivals. Yeah. Obviously, that's not a guarantee. I'm pretty sure they get Oregon too. As I continue to stall for time, as I look it up, oh boy, yeah, I forgot about this. Uh, Fresno State, Texas, um, Arkansas State, USC, Minnesota at Washington. Uh, later in the season, they ha- they host Oregon. They go to Ohio State. So I don't. So I mean, no, if John, comes no. Undefeated, just crown them. Uh, <laughs> Cancel the twelve team yeah, playoff. Yeah. Yeah, Georgia gets Clemson. Georgia gets Alabama. Like those are the two okay. big ones. Uh, they get Texas. That's the like, yeah. This is like this is not. I don't know. There's a world where Georgia's nine and three and in the playoff. I mean, I mean, probably not, but like it's possible because it's, I think we're going to see more two loss teams. And I, I, I ask you that because I don't think there's going to be a team in college football that goes undefeated next year. Mm-hmm. And I think that is going to be the most jarring thing for people. Cause we're, I mean, barring like something today, really yeah. surprising, like we're going to see a few teams go undefeated this year, at least into the uh, mm-hmm. leading into the playoff. 
And I just don't think that's going to happen. I say that, of course, and um, I apologize to any Florida fans that are, for whatever reason, listening to this. Uh, probably because you've angered them about something somehow. Yeah. yeah. I'm probably going to accidentally mush Florida here, but they're currently up 12 nothing on Florida State. So, like, that's one of those teams that is teetering. There you go. Uh, for obviously very yeah. different reasons. Yeah. Um, kind, of, kind of tough with, to, to win without your quarterback. Yeah. Yeah. And like a really devastating injury. And you just mm -hmm. hope that he gets back awful, as soon as possible awful, and healthy and all that. Uh, but yeah, like, I will be curious to see how teams that, you know, lose two games, are they, is that a six seed? Is that a seven seed? If they, you lose three games, or do you have a chance at the 12 seed? You know, like, because those, there's top seven, or is, or are we looking at like where there's, I don't know, to, not to pick on the Big 12, but where there's like four uh -oh. Big 12 teams that are 10 and two, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. they're just making up all the at large spots, like, because they don't have the same competition level that, the Big Ten, the SEC, or the ACC, right? Like, or there are there just extra uh, ACC and Big Twelve teams that get in because they didn't and expand Dame, right? with the same caliber of competition, right? Like, um, the Big Twelve adding Utah is obviously, I think, more notable than people realize. Um, but like, the other additions aren't exactly these football powers. So I do think, on some level, like Clemson, uh, Florida State, mm -hmm. um, Kansas State. Kansas, if Lance Leopold's still there, yeah. um, all of those teams like are going to have a better shot at it. So I'll be curious to see like how does ten and two Penn State, let's say, Can measure up to mm -hmm. like eleven and one Kansas State or eleven and one Kansas or eleven and one Oklahoma State. You know what I mean? Like these programs that clearly don't play the same level of competition. Because I think we're going to see more than ever next year. Like strength of record and strength of schedule Doesn't is going matter. to matter uh, significantly. So and like we'll probably see like three team three loss teams soon enough get in over two lost teams john you are just breezing right into 2024 um Listen, i think but that's the thing like this is what sucks for for you know penn state fans listening to this that like are, are excited about the yesterday and in and, and the game it's that it sorry to be a downer uh penn oh, state boy. fans but like it kind of doesn't matter for this year right like they're either going to go to a new year's explore or they aren't the win or lose which Either they're going to play well and it. Wow, John, that was, that was six profound. Months down the road. Either they're going to win or but, they're going to lose. But I'm saying it has no impact whether they win or lose, right? Like maybe you get like a little bit of recruiting momentum or something, but it's not, it doesn't really matter. And I, yeah. again, don't want to be the downer there, but like fans want their Who teams plays? to make the playoff. Play. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, they, they want their teams to make the playoff and they want to see like their favorite players playing. Who knows what that looks like, even, right? Like, uh, so yeah, I think. Right now, as soon as Penn State lost to Michigan, I think a lot of fans probably turned their attention to 2024. They out. And what for sure, like, for sure. You know, I don't even know if I'd call it checking out. I think like you, you don't you get excited for Rutgers checked, and Michigan checked State. Checked in or, or, uh -huh. or you're watching it with different purposes, right? You're right. watching it to see like what is Drew Aller working on? What are these young receivers doing? Like what's Caden Saunders look like? Like, uh, you know, as a Sixers fan, you Thank also you. know this, like during the process years, like mm -hmm. you watched for what guys could be. And I think as you get down the stretch of the season, this is what it's for. And like the bull game especially can be like, okay, like now you can see what this is going to look like next year. And that can be, it can be impactful and, and, and you can learn a lot about that. But I think, you know, there are already conversations I'm sure among fans like, okay, what does, what does yesterday against Michigan state mean for next year? Like, what does oh, it mean sure. against USC? I, I mean, that that's kind of the, the tone that I write with after, especially that second loss, right? Like we're looking um, at the future. Like I've been asking guys for something I'm working on about, okay, all the players who are redshirting this year, like what's transpiring behind the scenes uh, this season for them, right? Like it's, it's, you always have to be kind of keeping an eye toward the future. Um, and that John, because playoff caliber and you said Caden Saunders and I just want to make, I, I think I might have omitted him from my first two series earlier when we were talking I can't remember but I think you mentioned him sure we'll go with that uh but I'm definitely not delirious at all right now no, actually no. I feel great we talk about playoff caliber um Penn State has a playoff caliber defense we saw it again yeah Whew, I mean I, I, I wrote that yesterday like that Mm -hmm. This defense deserved to make the playoff. Adisa Isaac, they Chop Robinson to deserved to make the playoff. Kalen King deserved to make the playoff. I've seen some consternation about how Kalen has played. I think he's played really well. I just think he's not targeted as much. So when he mm -hmm. makes a mistake, it's more glaring. Um, but, you know, I, I it is a shame for those guys that they're not going to get a chance to play in the playoffs. A whopping negative 35 yards rushing for the Spartans. 
Is that good? <laughs> just <laughs> not not great, John. I know not big math people around here, but let me, but let me not jot great. that down so I know. Uh, not reference. yeah, negative numbers not good for for the Spartans. Um, Noted. Also, Michigan State just five first downs the entire game. Um, felt I mean, like it too. Five feels kind of high. <laughs> Like it, it yeah, like they couldn't get anything it going. definitely felt like, I mean, there was a Malik Carr play, like the explosive play. And then yep. there was a whole lot. There of was numbers. the play down the sideline on their first drive on the Jalen Reed pick um, yes. where there was, They're I think it was the a ball. corner route um, where actually Jalen Reed's a little bit, I, I, I don't want to like cast blame on him or anything. It looked like he might've been like getting over or I, I couldn't exactly see what happened there. Um, and again, don't have the all 22 to find out. Sounds um, like a complaint that you're lodging and here. Then, I mean, it's always a complaint. If anyone has all 22, send it to me. Uh, <laughs> Jay Sauber at centerdaily.com. My email's open. Uh, but no, I think like uh, it, outside of those two plays are the ones that I remember, right? The, the Malik Carr one and the, the deep pass down the right sideline uh, when they were heading away from us in the press box. Uh, and otherwise, like this defense suffocated them. Like, yeah, we I don't know that we talk enough about Jalen Reed and Adisa Isaac, right? Because I, mm-hmm. I wrote about this in Good, Bad, Ugly, like, Adisa Isaac is on some level overshadowed by Chop uh, Robinson. Yeah, for sure. Also, it's it's a little less true for this because Adisa has been so good that you have to really, really, him. really good. Yeah. But I think KJ Winston on some level has overshadowed Jalen Reed. That's not like a knock on Winston. He's been phenomenal. So is Jalen Reed. Like yeah. those, that's a really, really good starting safety duo and one that I think they can count on to be a strength of the defense next year. I said in the press box yesterday that, frankly, I think Winston's going to be their second best defender next year behind Denied Dennis Sutton. Uh, and I think mm, I'm not making predictions. Is that an Abdul anywhere. Carter omission right there, John? Are you just, I just, just glossing I th- over it's a, it's a No, I just think it's a positional value thing. I think I'd rather have uh, a high-end safety or a high-end pass rusher than a high-end linebacker. Interesting. Know. Interesting. Go Birds. Eagles philosophy that's on that, a, too. That's a, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a take well, right there. I don't think it is. Like You want you want <laughs> either to excel in pass coverage or rushing the passer, and like linebackers tend to have a harder time impacting that consistently. I do uh, wonder if we see Abdul Carter used in some different ways maybe next year. Right? That, like, I think, that, that I think is the, how you increase the value, mm-hmm. turning him into more of a pass rusher because I think he's capable of it. The, is the how you Micah show Parsons you role that we saw and then we're going to see more yeah, of in that junior we, year. And then At some point, we'll have a discussion about the Micah Parsons role and how one of the best pass <laughs> rushers in the NFL – uh, was used pretty much exclusively as a linebacker in college. Uh, yeah, yeah, there, but, there's, yeah, that, that's because listen, there, mm-hmm. if that guy's just consistently rushing in college, he's probably going first. Uh, because he got in the NFL and he was immediately doing it. Uh, but I digress, I don't want to have that. Discussion and again, today. this is someone who we didn't really even see start his freshman year either. Those yeah, always kind decision. of part of the I don't think I was, thing was I here. Was I here for that? I don't remember. I'm, I was here, I might have been for sure. I was here, yeah. Um, but I know it came up, uh, some fans have asked post game, if there's any injury update on Abdul Carter, um, he met with the media afterward. I didn't get a chance to talk to him, so I didn't get to ask. Neither did I, um, which is but a the, story for another day. The about fact the that he time. talked, <laughs> yeah, the fact that he talked leads me to believe that he's, he's fine. Cause when we don't get into yeah. players after games, right? Like that's why we didn't get Drew Aller until yesterday, um, because of him getting hurt against Rutgers. So I would assume Carter's okay. Um, but yeah, two sacks for Abdul Carter, Adisa Isaac with a sack, Jalen Reed with a sack, Curtis Jacobs with a sack and a half. Um, I'll have to go back and look at this because I was writing during most of the frantically during most of the fourth quarter. Keon Wiley was credited with the sack. Do you recall? I don't remember that. I don't know. So no, that's I probably don't. was buried in the laptop. Uh, yeah, and Johnny Dixon with a half right sack again. That point. Seven sacks for Penn State, uh, 12 tackles for loss just baffling numbers. And I do want to point out to a scene. um, It was early in the fourth quarter. And I like most of the D line, like defense was off the field. They were turned around looking in the stands behind them. And I'm like, what is going on? Like they're waving and smiling uh, enough that it caught my eye. And so I've got my binoculars and I am like literally trying to see all the way across the field, but it is not going well because it's, it's a far distance. Um, and I'm like, all right, yeah, there's somebody there me. in a Penn State shirt and like they're smiling and, and all this and waving. Um, so I asked Adisa Isaac afterward, I'm like, what was going on there? Uh, and it was former Penn State defensive line coach John Scott Jr., who's now the defensive line coach of the Detroit Lions. He was there in Penn State gear uh, cheering on these guys. And Adisa Isaac said it was really cool to see John Scott there uh, and that he's kind of, you know, still keeping tabs on those guys. So I thought that was a really, really neat moment. Um, 
just kind of a, a full circle moment for a lot of these guys too, the older players like Isaac, um, which again, John, I can't let us pass over that detail without saying that I had a delightful time at Ford field on Thanksgiving I did too. watching my <laughs> Packers win. Um, you were there. You might've placed some wagers Des- against despite the, the aspersions you tried to cast on me. I had a fantastic time. Uh, had a great time as those, Good. as people who follow us on Twitter probably saw, I, I was, I was deeply enjoying myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did you, what did you think of Ford field? Just like either for the, uh, the college game or, or the, Lions well, game? for the Penn state game, I did not enjoy being in an open air press box that when you leaned a little bit over the desk, you saw straight down, hated every second of that. I didn't, that did not bother uh, me at all. It was like, well, of course six not speed in front of us. Like, where were you going to fall to the row in front of us? No, but when you, when you have the fears that I have, it does not matter. <laughs> sounds like a, This sounds like a lot the, to unpack here, John. Cause that didn't even bother. That didn't even me register a, to me. Me and another unnamed beat reporter both noted this pretty quickly. Really uh, Interesting. Yeah. I think you know who I'm talking about. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize you and Bob Flounders had such it was not, uh, it was versions not to heights. Oh. You know, Bob doesn't care. Uh, but no, I, I thought it was really the the field itself or the the stadium itself was really nice. Um, I like being indoors. I got confused. It got windy during the yeah. I don't know uh, where like the game. I yeah. didn't understand where that was coming from, and I kept getting confused why my paper was blowing around. Yeah, that um, was weird. Yeah, but no, I thought it was it was a nice setup um, for our sake. I thought it was it was really helpful. Um, you know, the, the game on Thursday, I thought it was a great time. The, the power hour they have when you get in early. Yeah. Um, I think a, a lot of stadiums to there in Detroit take too. note of that. Uh, yeah, it went to Sweetwater Tavern, which I would highly mm-hmm. recommend if you're ever in Detroit, which was delicious. Fantastic Shout out wings. to your uh, your colleague, Colton Pouncey at The yep. Athletic, who, who led us speaker. there. And uh, um, went to Speaker Box to get some <laughs> coffee, some Irish coffee. Yeah. Uh, Friday mo- or Thursday, Thursday morning. Thursday morning. Yeah. Saw the Thanksgiving Day Parade. We, I mean, John, not many people, like I feel like this is very much a sports writer thing, right? People think our jobs are great. They think they're cool because we're covering all these games, right? But what they don't see <laughs> is us eating Thanksgiving dinner out of Buffalo Wild Wings, right? Like well, this is just one of those. And it's like, well, hey, they got the Cowboys on. Yeah, it's like they got the Cowboys on and well, you know, here we are. Um, but no, it was a great trip. I thought, honestly, the Ford Field setup for this particular game, I really liked. Um, obviously, for the Packers, of course, for my, my selfish reasons, I really thought the sight lines there were very nice. Um, yeah. Again, people like me. Not a not a bad vision. seat in the house. Yeah. I mean, even again, the, the crazies like me who go to see their team play and bring their binoculars because they want to be able to see well, we had no issues. Um, and for, in terms of covering a game, I thought, again, the, you mentioned to the, the indoor element, Love that. Um, yeah, it's nice not November. like having to try to guess if the uh, heat's going to be on in the press box. So even though it's cold mm-hmm. out, should I not wear a hoodie because it's going to be too warm in the press box? Well, and you can, I mean, you can hear the noise, right? And they were pumping yeah. a lot of noise, especially early on. Uh, I was surprised with how good the crowd was just because I feel like I've covered plenty of games at Spartan Stadium where, again, it's land grant game. It's late in the year. The weather's bad and you don't get a great turnout. Uh, that was not the case. I mean, there were a lot of people there. James Franklin said afterward that he thought this game really worked out for both sides, which obviously I think Penn State very much benefited from this and playing in an area that's been really good to them, playing indoors, not having to worry about the snow, the lightning delays, all the crazy stuff they've gone through uh, in Lansing during James Franklin's tenure especially. But, yeah, I I thought this was a really, really neat game. I, again, we're not going to see Penn State play Michigan State next year, which is why Penn State gets to keep the Land, Gro- Land Grant Trophy for two years. Uh, lucky them. They've got a nice extra end table now in the facility. The, yeah, they have to find extra storage space. Um, I'm sure they're thrilled. Caden Sa- or not Caden Saunders. Gosh, why am I? Uh, Caden Wallace and Devon Elise were carrying the trophy off. Uh, I afterward. would like to see Caden Saunders carry the trophy off. I tell you what, this thing is a, it is just an absolutely massive. I will say, it's John, because I know it's huge. It's cumbersome. There's it took two always, linemen to carry it. Yeah. And they were struggling a bit, right? Like that is the solid walnut base, um, which actually the wood product company that made the base. Cause I'm again, I'm in the weeds on this trophy. The wood company yeah, that made the base uh, is an Ohio company. And when the company was sold, it was bought by a gentleman who's actually a Penn state alum. 
And the gentleman then found out after the fact that this company he bought had a role in the land grant trophy. And then he said he started looking up all the publicity about the trophy and was like, Ooh, I don't think that we should tell people about that. Um, so again, just a weird quirky college football connection. It was a nice scene. Uh, we were not allowed on the field afterward just cause like yeah, NFL stadiums, I, you can't typically, well, I don't, I don't think we were allowed two years ago at Michigan state either. I don't um, remember because that was um, the snow game, not to bring this up again, but we're, Key oh, that might have been a COVID nine thing. straight times. There's that might have been a COVID 21 thing. though. Yeah, no, but I think because I remember being on the field there before when okay. at the end of the yeah. lightning delay game. Um, okay. Then, yeah, maybe. But, that'll but maybe, yeah, they could have changed back. things. But um, it, no. So I didn't like in terms of an I know people on Twitter were asking, like, was there a trophy presentation? I haven't had a chance to even rewatch the game yet since I got home today. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like I mean, I. I was there as the players came up the tunnel with it. And that's kind of all you could see. Um, there was an interesting scene. I'd like to point out that I tweeted out um, between Frank Leonard, the analyst and Jay Juan Sider uh, after the game, very animated scene, which I think I point this out because I think it's a good example of what this game and this play calling opportunity means for Jay Juan Sider, right? Like I think that's something that, Mike maybe glossed over in all of this is what it means for Cider and Howell and the fact that like James Franklin's doing these Zoom interviews. I mean, it certainly sounds like the way at least the head coach has been talking that he's making a hire outside from these two. Is that do you have the same sense that I get just in gut reaction to that? Yes. Uh, yeah. 100%. I mean, I don't think that's like surprising or shocking. I just think that's kind of how this has transpired. Um, and again, you've got guys who don't have a ton of play calling experience, but I do think this was a significant moment for them. Um, and again, like this offense feels like and looks like it's it's turning the corner. Um, so I wanted to wanted to point that out now. So, John, kind of where do we go from here? Because you've got at some point the NOC is going to be hired. We I know we'll hear from James Franklin. Typically, we hear from him next Sunday after bowl selection. Um, so there's going to be a lot to sort through. The coaches will be heading back out on the road, right? Um, I don't know if you if you zoned out for this or if you were locked in during this portion of the presser when James Franklin was outlining. Like, I'm always schedule. locked in. Yeah, when he, well, then you, because that's when he mentioned the Saturday-Sunday interviews. That's mm -hmm. when he uh, he mentioned that they're going to be watching a lot of uh, recruiting film over the next few days. So And figure out who's going where. Because uh, it's always – it's a weird time because you have, it's like everyone's kind of on the same hamster on a wheel routine, everybody else included. And then it's like, Oh yeah, there's not a game this week. So kind of what, what happens, you know? Yeah. It's uh, I don't know what to do with myself week, which is strange. Uh, but you it's know, nice. next things, the next thing feels like it's the offensive coordinator hire and mm -hmm. you know, whatever happens with Manny Diaz or any other assistants, right? Like that feels like it's it uh, for once it, there are no James Franklin anything, which is nice. Don't <laughs> jinx it. No, Don't jinx it. I know that's it's on me. No rumors. I, I, as I look at my phone, just to make sure. I haven't seen any message board posters like saying that James Franklin's on a flight to another city with a college team. No uh, flight. No flight program. tracking for us these yeah. days. Doesn't doesn't seem like it. But no, I think that's it. Right? I think the that's it's the coordinator stuff, the assistant stuff. Just kind of waiting to see where that goes. Um, but we'll have all that covered. I am going to put you on the spot one more time before we go, though. Oh, gosh, Who are the top man. four at the end of the season? Who makes the playoff? Because we watched. Oh, uh, gosh. I, I thought you mention. were like asking me we for watched... my OC candidates there. And I was no, like, no, no, wow, no. John. We watched. Is... Well, we have stories about those. You can find those yeah. on. Yeah, yeah you say you can. Yeah, you can find. There's about a dozen candidates I put out there. Yeah. yeah. But I, I asked this because we watched Ohio State, Michigan, mm -hmm. and I think it helped contextualize that like uh, Penn State's defense holding both those teams down relatively well the way they did, like. I mean, it just shows that that unit is on that level. Uh, but do you think curious. Michigan's the top team in the country? No, I think it's Georgia. Georgia. I say yeah. that's probably one. You know, you Michigan, want my actual? Would you put Michigan two? Take? No. Do you know who I think the best team in the country no. is? No. Who? Oregon. Interesting. Yeah, but they lost. So. Uh, so that's... now, if I don't think they should be number one, to be clear, because you lost. Like the rankings matter for resume. But if you ask me who the best team in the country is right now, I think it's Oregon. Um, where would you, I'm curious, it? where would you put Ohio state? Well, with the injury at Florida state, uh, there, mm -hmm. there, I think they're the, so what is, what is the current score in this game right now? Florida state, 12 Florida to seven state. last I checked, uh, yeah, 12 to seven at halftime. Okay. Florida is winning over Florida state. 
So I would have, are you talking the rankings or where I think they like what number I think they are? You know what I mean? Like, do you want a resume style? Or if I were just listing, this is the best team. This is the second best team. I don't think there's any difference, right? Like where there is a big difference. Cause I, well, I, it goes where to what I is, said. like, I think Oregon is the best team in the country, but they don't have they They lost. So they're not. So they're clearly not because they lost. No. Well, That's, when they win the national title, see, I'll make is, you eat crow. We're now statement. giving listeners a very good inside I, baseball look of what the last 12 hours in the car have been like for John I think, and I. I think the, the listeners will understand what I'm saying completely, that I think they are the best team in the country right now, but they did lose a game earlier this year. And so you can't rank them number one. Um, Sorry. So where would you, <laughs> back to where would you put Ohio State then? Right so now where, with one loss, If where where would you rank them? Are you all in on Kyle McCord? No, I mean I've been. We could listen to the post game pod if you if you want my well, thoughts on. Well, but again, you're you're. Ohio State's I asked offense. about your one loss for next year against uh, Ohio State, so. I don't know that, that has much to do with Ohio State as it does Penn State, though. You know. Uh, sure. But I I would they would obviously be behind Michigan, Georgia. Um, I don't know. Probably well, yeah, in a they tier lost. with. Probably in a tier with. Um, your ducks. No, with with Washington and Oregon and. and uh, or not, sorry, not Oregon with Washington and Florida state and Texas mm -hmm. in that group. Okay. So interesting. So the, on the outside looking in group, so you have Washington on the outside looking in, I think they're going to lose next week to Oregon. I don't think it's going to matter. So you're, yeah, a, I, you're interested. I did not know that you were all in on the ducks, John. This is new. This is news. Dan Lanning is a really good coach. So is Will Stein, their offensive coordinator. Uh, Bo Nix looks like a totally different quarterback, which I think is a which test really one to him. <laughs> And, makes and you Will wonder Stein. about Auburn. Yeah, right. <laughs> but well, next you got outplayed by Sean regime. Clifford. I think it uh. makes you wonder about the Brian Harson regime there at that Auburn. Mm -hmm. at Auburn. Uh, but no, I think, yeah, I mean, their defense is awesome. They have a ton of weapons on offense. Uh, they're a lot of fun to watch. Bucky Irving's a great running back. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I think, you know, if I so pick do we, a final do we have four a that four? actually makes it. So I think, I think do, are, are we agreeing on Georgia one, Michigan two? For who makes it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Georgia, Georgia and Michigan, I think, are pretty much One, set in two. stone. I think even if both lose next week, they make it. Oh, you know, that's, uh, that's a very perverse thought. Yeah, <laughs> but sure. don't worry. Uh, but I think Georgia and Michigan are going to be one and two. Three will probably end up being Washington? Oregon. Uh, I think they're going to lose because yeah, that's your, 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 yeah. you're projecting losses. Uh, uh, Three would be Oregon, and then four. That's when it gets tough because it's probably like, Ohio State and Texas. Unless Louisville upsets Florida State, and then I don't think yeah. Louisville's like really that good, though. I think that's a little more fraudulent than the others. But uh, I would probably, man, I think at that this, point you probably give it to Ohio State because they've. Well, the this loss. is what I'm. Go this is what I'm going back to. Do do does the Big Ten help? If I could talk, does the Big Ten get two teams in? I think yes. I, I've, it, now, if Washington beats uh, it's for, or Oregon next week, none right. of that matters. Right, right, right. But yeah, I think I think the Big Ten ends up getting two. The SEC gets one, and uh, Pac-12 gets one. So, in, so this, I, again, your your Oregon intrigue here. I, that's that's new. I am. I don't think it is. <laughs> I big on Oregon. I just, you know, what, John, I'm a man it, of it, conviction. I was gonna say you you seem pretty bought in. Um, no, I was just glad that you know we had a day to get to actually watch college football because doing these jobs we've mentioned it before you often miss so many other games because you're either getting to a yeah. game or a press box or circling a parking garage or going to an interview room and you're just kind of seeing yep. snippets of games often um so that was very nice john i'm guess will we be back mid would midweek <laughs> yes yes we will be <laughs> is, back is that our plan do we have a plan here at the nitty dispatch i think we do um, we'll be here every week for a while. Uh, is my yeah. Guess. We'll uh, we'll just kind of be hanging out here, seeing what the, what we what won't the have next brings. week is a post game pod because there's no game. Uh, but and it, I am sure when things happen, we'll have an emergency. True. Yeah. So whenever an OC is named, we will absolutely um, have we'll something to you as soon as possible after that. Um, but yeah, we will gather uh, at some point this week, probably middle of the week, maybe Thursday, Wednesday, something like that. Just kind of see where things land heading into bowl selection. Again, if there's any OC news, we'll certainly pivot to that. Um, and then I'll talk for 30 minutes about how awesome Oregon is. <laughs> yeah. So then, then apparently this has just become a ducks podcast. I don't know 
how and when or why that happened, but here we are. Um, John, any other last thoughts from the no, land grant I think, game? I think there, if you're a Penn State fan, you should come out of that one feeling pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, and you should be excited. And I again, I don't want to turn the page next year when this year's not over yet, but you know, if you're looking forward to next year, like you have a lot of reason to look forward to August 31st against West Virginia, right? I think that is. Is um, that the date? Is that what the game is? I don't know. Sure. Sounds right. Yeah, I, I don't know why I already know that, but I do. <laughs> that's um, yeah. That's that's a little alarming. I use. I'm usually not date guy either. Like, I don't, yeah, you're, yeah. I'm guessing most of the time. I just. Uh, I know but I think the portal date is coming. The open portal. Yeah, portal December day 4th. is coming. Yeah. Uh, but no, I think fans should be excited. Um, if you want to read, of course, what Audrey and I wrote about last night's game, uh, and what we're going to be writing about Penn State. You can check Audrey out at theathletic.com at oddsnyder4 on Twitter. You can find me at centerdaily.com at C-E-N-T-R-E -E because State College is located in Center County. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at John Sauber, J-O-N-S-A-U-B-E-R. Uh, but that'll do it for this time. We are looking forward to probably multiple emergency podcasts throughout the offseason. Uh, we'll be back every week, though, as, as, as we have been uh, for most of the season. Uh, but until next time, thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.